What's going on guys, Way From Revolution here, here with an absolute legend in the watch industry, Kari Butalainen. How are you, sir? I'm doing fine, thank you. Very well. And so the first thing I want to say to you is happy 20th anniversary. Thank you very much, thank you. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, I think it's, uh, I mean, to achieve, and things are doing fine, so I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> so, Kari, yeah. I want to start this interview off with a name, and you please tell me what this means to you. And the name is Charles Melon. Hello, Jacques Melan was my colleague in the work, first of all, when I came to, to work in, in Switzerland. And then he became a friend. Uh, and, and, and then also I did learn a lot from him. So he was the person who had a lot of knowledge. I mean, uh, generations in his family, they were watchmakers. And, and he made a watchmaking school in the time that uh, they did, like, he did like a three school watch. Wow. Normal pocket watch, split chronograph, and mini tripeter. Wow! As, uh, <laughs> Incredible. And, uh, yeah, and yeah. he he had a lot of uh, knowledge and experience. And as he was working, uh, uh, like a, it was like his hobby. He, he didn't have to work anymore, and uh, so he had time to show and explain why things are done like that. And I did learn a lot. Amazing. And. Uh, and even since he moved uh, to France afterwards, he had some health problems and he moved to south of France and we did visit him regularly. Oh, how nice. Until his death, so a couple of times per year. That's he so spent nice. Long weekends or so, so with him. So that was nice. Carrie, what I like is when you do something, you really commit to it. And so when you join Parmigiani Fleurier in the restoration department after you finished the high complication um, uh, course at Woodstep, you stayed there for actually nine years. Mm -hmm. And if I'm not mistaken, Mr. Melon was um, overseeing the restoration department there. And you guys really worked well together and he even encouraged you to make your own watch. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and he was taking care of those unique pieces as well, what I did uh, most of my time. And when I started over there, he told me that uh, he was trying to push me a little bit at make your own watch. <laughs> and, and of course, uh, mini tribute. I, mean, I even bought the Ebosch, a movement from him, and I started to, to make a, a mini tribute, a chronograph, and split one. So that's still halfway. Really? Yeah, yeah. That was my first thing that I started. Yeah. But then a pocket watch. Right. But then uh, I, I went to Germany a couple of times to, to see Mr. Miklos. Right. So Mr. Miklos, Hishach Miklos, he was a self taught watchmaker. So his profession, he was a teacher in the school, teaching metal work for the boys. And watchmaking was his hab hobby. So he was spending his, all his free time to making watches. So he did very fine two beyonds. And, and I went to see him a couple of times. And over there, I did learn also a lot. So he, he didn't have any, he didn't own a small lathe. And he did everything with that. Incredible, with one small lathe. One small lathe. <laughs> That's amazing. And with a bow and hand tools. And this is, did this inspire you in 1994 to make your, your first tourbillon? Absolutely, so that was the insp inspiration for me. And, and I did, as I said, I did learn a lot. And, uh, and at that time I didn't have any obligation to make my living with that. It was pure passion, as it is still today, but over that I could take my time to do things. Amazing. It seems like this metier is one that really rewards people that actually try to explore even more. You mm -hmm. know, when I talked to Fonso Paul, for example, um, he was deeply influenced by you know this, these books by George Daniels, um, mm -hmm. uh, Breguet, and then also Watchmaking by George Daniels. I know yes. Watchmaking also played a, a role for you as well. Mm -hmm. What did that book mean to you as you tried to pursue a higher level of watchmaking? Right, it was also sort of Bible for me, also that uh, art of watchmaking and and those books uh, what Daniels made, but also all the books and, and the history. So, of course, and then examples, when you see people that they are doing those examples, as I told that uh, Mr. Miklos and uh, Daniels, I didn't know him. All these people, they are, they are giving you the inspiration and spirit and it, it, it makes you hungry. Then you want to learn more and then you want to do by yourself. I, I, at least for me, it made sense that I want to do by myself. So I was really willing to do things. That's incredible. So uh, in 99, you finish working at Parmigiani Fleurier and you go back to Wistap. And this time it is with the idea of spending half the time teaching and half the time working on your own brand. But in the mm. end, you're doing pretty much all your time teaching. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, or even more than 100%. So I was far too much involved. And, and then my workshop wasn't anymore at home. Right. 
so I, I had already my tools and uh, lathes and whatever and, and I, I had already workshop in the village and I was dreaming that I have time to do things but I just didn't have any time. I was I decided okay now I have to do something I really like. It was the other thing that you're referring to the fact that you created beautiful movements but with other people's names on them and I think was it Philip Dufour who at one point who encouraged you to say you know Kari do your own watch. No that was later on. Yes. I, to start as independent it was rather that my my brother passed away. Oh I'm sorry. So that was something that like that okay if life can end like that okay I'll do what I like really. Right. So that's why I, I I started to do work by myself. I saw independence who lost the independence and I was thinking I had to remain alone. So that's why I started to work for other companies at the beginning. Right. Yeah, you know, I, I, I mean, and if you don't mind me asking about you about this, uh, I guess so it was the impact of your, your brother passing away very young mm -hmm. um, was a, kind of, I guess, a, a, a trigger for you to say, okay, I have to achieve all that I, 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 I said yeah. I want to in life. Mm -hmm. But then also to be able to see, as, as you know, as you were mentioning, um, independent watchmakers who became purchased by big groups or by other individuals yeah. and eventually eroding away their sense of independence, right? Exactly. Right. Incredible. So, yeah, the independent for me, there is this financial independence. For me, it's a part of that, that I can decide what I want to do. Yes. <laughs> it's not my uh, guy who is financing that he, he's telling that now you make more boy. <laughs> <laughs> so let's, let's cut to 2004. Am I correct that, that the um, chronograph movement that you created, the in-house chronograph movement yeah. that you created based or inspired by the Bajur 2023 yes. mm -hmm. was the first in-house movement that you made? Yes, actually, by, by pocket, for pocket wristwatch. watch, yeah. yeah, wristwatch, that was first. And, and, and so that was a small series. Yes. And then I, I had also these repeaters ongoing. And uh, so what I did, I had customers asking that I make something which is more reasonable price. Right. <laughs> so so that's why we ended up to, to make the, the puzzle. Yeah. Uh, no, the puzzle, 2006. Oh, yes, I remember. 2006. Yes, very cool. Um, so this was the Observatoire, am I correct? Exactly. In 2007. Now, what I find remarkable when you created this was there was one amazing innovation in this watch, mm -hmm. which was a hairspring that had two terminal curves, yeah. a Grossman inner curve and a Phillips outer curve. And I just want to point out to people that Kari was the very first person to do this um, in a wristwatch. Right? Mm -hmm. It was used before in those uh, chron chronometer competition watches. Ah, I see. Because that was used. Yes. So uh, the movements that they would submit to the... Yeah, because yeah. But of course it needs more work. Yeah. So it, it wasn't really used on the commercial watches because right. it took too much time. But uh, this type of hairspring, it uh, removes the influence, we call it pinning point. Right. So it, the pinning point is the, the, uh, the ratio, where is the start of the hairspring according to the, for instance, the main position when it's a regular hairspring or pinning point uh, according to the um, the regulator when it's a flat hairspring. Right. So, and it has to be have a safe, certain angle to, with a normal hairspring, to, to be able to achieve the good timing. Wow. So there are rules, but when we, because normally the hairspring should, when, when we look at the hairspring, it should go until the center, but we can't go because there's a shaft. Right. And, and we call it collet, yeah. which is holding the hairspring. So that's why it can't be done like that. We're bringing the, uh, the weight of the hairspring in the center of the uh, balance wheel. Wow, amazing. And, and the center of the gravity is, center of gravity in, is in the center. And, and therefore the breathing is much more concentric then? Uh, in, but it doesn't really have an influence for that. But really? it has that for the weight. But that the, the weight of the, the hairspring the is in the middle. Wow, that's really interesting. And, and it removes that effect of the pinning, pinning point. Yes, of the pinning point. Wow, that's really cool. But it has to be done properly. <laughs> that it's uh, yes, that it works. <laughs> Otherwise, it doesn't. It doesn't. Yes, it's even worse. It's a marketing tool. <laughs> uh, but then it's a marketing tool. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, so in 2007, um, uh, this watch that you created, the Observatoire, uh, it won your first Grand Prix, right? Exactly. Because how did that make you feel? So the Grand Prix de Genève is like the Academy Awards of watchmaking. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe you won the category for men's watch. With exactly. That. How did that make you feel? Well, I was. Um, surprised but also very proud that uh, the work is recognized quite many years 15 years ago right. but I was very happy and proud about that yes and of course it has 
effect for the demo. People were asking more watches and all these things. Yes. So it was very good for us. Yes, and I think that was the first of your eight a Grand Prix awards, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, exactly. That well, was the first. Thing. Well done, sir. Thank you. Um, you mentioned the minute repeater. Let's talk a little bit about that. Um, I, that was the first time I ever met you. I was with Theodore Deal. And I remember he brought me to, um, at the time, a very small atelier where you were working. Exactly. Um, and, and you showed me the minute repeater. And I was struck immediately by the fact that it was a decimal minute repeater. Yeah. Um, why did you want to create a decimal minute repeater? I did these uh, striking watches uh, uh, in Parmigiani. Right. So those unique pieces. And I, I thought that it's uh, Ill illogical when it's striking like that. So we have to calculate that. I thought it would be more uh, logical. Yeah. To do it that way, and that yes. was my reflection behind. So that's why I made it. And when you see the biggest brand in the world now also accepting this as a more logical way to, to strike the time, do you yeah, yeah. see Okay, not bad. But, but I think that today also these um, complicated watches has, there is less uh, enthusiasm around the complicated watches, in my opinion. Really? Yeah, I think so, because I have a feeling that at that time there was more complicated stuff and and today it's it's it's, it's not the same anymore, right. in my opinion. Right. But I can I get, feel. I get what you're saying. Um, let's go from there to 2011 when you launch uh, the Vat Wheat. Uh, yes. You know, which is a seminal moment for you. It's uh, in-house base caliber, which would then have allow you to create further complications on top mm -hmm. of it. It features, of course, a large balance wheel, 2.5 hertz, a vibrational speed, your your famous hairspring with the inner Grossman curve and the outer Phillips or Breguet yep. overcoil, uh, but in a very interesting escapement. Yes. Tell me why you decided to pursue this uh, double wheel escapement, which I, I, I assume was inspired by Breguet's Echapmon uh, Natural. Yeah. Exactly. We started the development of the movement uh, 2008. It took three years for us, and that watch had uh, this natural escapement. Wow. It was a uh, two beam made by Breguet. Right. And I was impressed about that, um, how it worked. And, and, and then by studying and reading more, and then that escapement always came to my mind. Wow. And then when we started to do uh, the construction of our movement, I was thinking that we have to do something which we are able to do everything by ourselves. That escapement has parts in, in certain uh, geometry that we can do everything with the conventional machines. Wow. And that's the reason why, one of the reasons why, of course, we did fir very first prototypes, just like a, to see how the escapement works. So that it, it, it's really running. We started to do the, the prototypes with the real movement. Yeah. And, and we noticed that uh, it's very perform. Wow. So we see that it has about 30 percent more, more performance comparing the Swiss Libre X game. Wow. So it's 30% more efficient. Yes. Yeah, so it means that for the longer power, power reserve. reserve. Yeah. And then the another thing what I, I, I noticed now is that it's, it's what I was thinking at that time that the, as the action between the escape wheel and the balance wheel is exactly like on the chronometer escapement. Yeah. And then the action between the escape, escape wheel teeth and the locking jewel is as well it's the same as uh, uh, chronometer escapement. And the chronom chronometer escapement, it runs without oil. Right. But the escape wheel should be made um, from gold. Right. And if, there's a, if it's steel, it needs to be a little bit lubricated. But normally it's not very sensible for the oiling, so viscosity can change, but it doesn't ruin the timing. And, and may I ask, what are your escape wheels made from? Steel. And do, so there's a bit of lubrication on there? Yeah, we put a little bit, okay. but it doesn't really, it's not sensible, we can put a little bit of crease and it runs. Right. And we can see the watches after 10 years, I mean, they're still running. And did you say if you made them out of gold that they wouldn't need lubrication? Yeah. That's, that's because cool. gold is like all, all, um, auto lubrificating material. That's really cool. Yeah, but the tip is too thin, uh, too weak. Ah, so okay. that's why it's for the longevity why we are doing that. I mean, the longevity is one, and another way is a weight. Yes. Because uh, there's always advance and disadvantage. So advance is this longevity, uh, the performance, and the disadvantage is that we have more inertia, that we have we are turning more wheels. Right. 
Swiss sleeper, it's only one wheel. Right. But here we have a, uh, those two wheels and driving wheels as well. So there's more things to turn. Is that more, does it consume more energy? Well, we have to turn these wheels, so it, it consumes. Right. But uh, I haven't go on the direction of the new materials, which, which, which could be very light. Right. So I'm using classical materials. Yes. So we, just, we do these driving wheels from German silver and XKB is from uh, steel. Right. I believe uh, piece um, number 000 of this watch was sent to the Besançon Observatory. Not that one, but we have made a few, uh, few tests. Yes. And, and, and how, how do they perform? Our difficulty had, was rather the, the temperature compensation. Oh, interesting. Okay. Because which is also the the marriage between the hairspring and the, the balance wheel. Right. But, uh, but when we are looking at the, the, the timing, when we are timing the watch, uh, over there we can do results which are easily inside the chronometer requirements. Wow, fantastic. So that's not a problem. Tari, why do you think the world has gone absolutely crazy for independent watchmaking? I think there's some multiple reasons. First of all, I, I assume that it's a reason that uh, all the hype with auctions, so the watchmaking, the more people are interested because the prices are getting crazy. And due to that, uh, those bigger brands, they are struggling with deliveries and they have a long delivery time. Right. So then, of course, customers are getting frustrated. And, and then when you are making tens of thousands or more watches, so uh, then you are one customer of tens of thousands. Right. So you are no, you are no more special. Right. So that's one thing. Right. And I think that the COVID did change everything, because uh, when we think about the physical presence uh, during the Basel Fair, so during the Basel Fair or SHH, it's only SH. Nothing else doesn't exist. All the press is writing about brands which are inside and so on. So, and. Independence has been a little bit forget right. because there's no more room for it and so on. Multiple reasons. But when it's a COVID, we are everybody is on the same platform. Right. There's no more physical presence. Yes. So the Rolex is as big as uh, we. <laughs> <laughs> you have sure. a website. Right. And and there's no difference anymore. Correct. And I think that's the biggest right. be, because we have had customers uh, coming to us and they say that you know, during the COVID, I was on the internet and I discovered wow. independence because I never saw that before. Right. Because they were looking on the auctions and the Patek Philippe and the Rolex and so on. And suddenly, when there's more time to go internet, they start to discover. Yes. Kara, how do you define independent watchmaking? For me, the independent watchmaking is the, the person or the company, it can be a company also, but who, who are doing their watches, if you are buying parts, uh, you are depending on your suppliers. Of course, you can buy something, but at least you should do something <laughs> instead of buying and then you make a little bit finishing. Right. Of course, you are independent, you do it, but it's a different philosophy. And another thing, what I see is that the financial independence, that you are more or less alone, right. and then you can decide by yourself. Then you are independent. Otherwise, you are depending somebody. <laughs> You're dependent on watchmaking. <laughs> you, are, you are depending on the financial partner. Right. Or well, then, yeah. if you don't do, you are depending on your suppliers. Right, exactly. But we need suppliers, but at least in certain extent. And at least your construction is made by yourself. So it, it's a fine line. You now have a dial factory, Colomb mm -hmm. Le Mine, and you also have a case factory as well, which is with Lennon Katyn as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. And actually, if I'm not mistaken, you were even capable of doing movements as well. Um, yes. Right. So what was the motivation for this? And, and did you think it was also important to help out your fellow sort of smaller brands or independents? The starting point to have a dial factory was my uh, own uh, struggles to find the quality dials and to have a decent delivery time. And, and, and so I was struggling with that, even thought we were making the ebosh of the dial, we were doing engine turning. And then, but it was such a struggle right. to find somebody who was willing to do and who could do quality. Right. I was getting very upset about that. Wow. And then things just happened that, that one company was available. And, and then when I uh, got it, I was thinking that we have to do the service for independence as 
I'm struggling and I was struggling, so let's help and keep it small and do something which is has a reason uh, that we are helping independence and making unique pieces, a small series and like that, instead of taking this uh, uh, industrial road. So we don't have that industrial approach, but we have this uh, uh, individual approach, but then it needs different type of stuff. You, you, you have to have a stuff which is uh, uh, very uh, flexible yeah. and who can create things and so it's another challenge afterwards. Amazing. Um, how does it feel to have your daughter working with you now? Well, of course, I mean, first of all, I have never pushed our kids to, to do whatever. I have always said that they have to have a profession that they think that the Monday morning is the best morning of the week. <laughs> But that, we talked about this, and they yeah. have to wake up super happy to go to work yeah. and really passionate about yeah, it. Exactly. My daughter, she found uh, the passion for the watchmaking by herself. Right. So it was her personal experience, and, and, and I'm very happy and proud of her that uh, she's uh, working with us. Amazing. So that's very nice. Kari, uh, if, you know, everyone kind of looks at you as an amazing success story. I know you have, for every one watch that you create, probably hundreds if not thousands of people that want to buy that watch. Over the last 20 years, has there ever been a moment where you really struggled? And if so, what was that? Well, yeah, there have been, but well, the life is always there, up and down. But for instance, we talk about these dials. So that was 2013. We had the, that, uh, we call it 28 Air, the model, yeah. uh, which had the power reserve at 12 o'clock, yes. 25 watches. So. We were designing the dial and the dial uh, factory, uh, was, which was in, in La Chaux-Font. They had to make prototypes. But at the same time, there was a change of the owner of the company, the new director and so on. And then suddenly, our stuff was put it aside. No. And 2013, I spent something like three months without any incomes. Wow. Because Cause you can deliver watches because we had no we, dials. Yes, yes, and we were concentrating on that model yeah. that we will do and deliver. And, and that wake, wake me up. Right. And of course, uh, every, every week calling that, okay, dials are getting ready. Yeah, 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 Friday they are ready. And then Friday morning, oh, I will come to up. Oh, no, we have one problem. Oh dear. Every, every week the same. And of course, you start to lose a little bit of patience and the, the confidence that what's next, when? And then the customers are, well, the customers not that angry, but, but for us that uh, have to pay salaries and uh, we were some like 13 people yes. at that time. Yeah. All the bills are coming, <laughs> <laughs> but money didn't come. Incredible. So that waked me up. Incredible. That, and then it was just afterwards that, that uh, Dial Factory was in bankrupt. Oh, and wow. then we got dials, then I got money and then I could Go ahead. Excellent. <laughs> but uh, it was uh, such a, and that really was, was a, a bad time. Like a struggle yeah. for me. Amazing. Well, Kari, there's nothing more than to congratulate you on 20 amazing years of success. You make beautiful watches. You remind the entire industry what real quality is in terms of watchmaking. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Waiko. Thank you so Thank much. You much. Thank sir. you. Thank you. Cheers.